Good morning, everyone. This is Jamie Ertz with Cytoviva, and I'm going to be conducting the uh, webinar this morning on the Cytoviva 3D Enhanced Dark Field Imaging System. Um, I am the technical um, specialist slash application specialist uh, at Cytoviva, and I the people who pioneered this technology along with others at Site of Eva. So this morning we're going to go over the different parts of the system. We're going to see a sample and I'm going to explain a little bit about the software and the hardware. So this will be the agenda for this webinar. I'm going to do a brief introduction on the company and then I'm going to show an example. I have a couple of different examples main one I'm going to be working with is a cell with a DAPI stain nucleus and 80 nanometer gold particles. I'm going to go over a couple of papers and some applications for the 3D technology and then I'm going to do a brief overview of the Cytoviva patented option and briefly explain deconvolution and point spread function and how that relates to um, getting a, a well-constructed 3D stack or image and then we're going to go over the 3D parameters for acquisition and then some features of the software that include capture, deconvolution, um, and nanoparticle location. And then I'm going to explain a little bit more detail how these three main functions of the software work, which are point spread function generation, uh, 3D analysis software, which has a couple of different components uh, within it, and then a nanoparticle, uh, or sorry, a numerical aperture generator which calculates the numerical aperture of the system uh, just based off the scatter of a single object and then we're going to have a q a at the end um, if you'll notice at the bottom left i believe of the global meet uh, main box meeting box there's a a chat function so if you uh, have any questions i'm going to field those at the very end um, if you can wait until then that'd be great if not you can go ahead and type them in and i'll look over them at the end here so I'm just going to give you a brief company background. We are a technology company that's located in Auburn, Alabama, and the core technology came out of Auburn University. So there we are there in the bottom left. That is our office building. We are on the third floor in the top right. Those windows are us. And we are in the uh, Auburn University Research Park. The company was founded in 2004, and it was a company that came out of a larger company to commercialize academic technology. These are some of our clients, as well as their applications. Um, on the left, we have a lot of uh, you know, government agencies in the center, uh, academic. And in the right side, in the right column here, we have uh, private industry. And one thing you'll notice throughout all of these applications that are listed beneath each organization is nano. Everything is nano. Um, as I'll explain later, talking more in detail about the dark field optics, our system um, does an excellent job of identifying and detecting particles that are below the resolution limit. And we'll go over um, a little bit more of that. But first, I want to take you guys. Um, through a video here that I have. And this video basically shows what you typically see with our microscope. Um, for those of you that already have our technology, you know that um, our dark field optics are really the core of the whole system. Um, you know, in addition to selling just the dark field optics, many of you may know that or have, we have a hyperspectral imaging system. And so we're able to get a hyperspectral image of anything under the microscope. Um, but the core of this whole system is the dark field optics. And so if you're familiar with our technology or have seen any of our videos, you'll, you'll probably find this familiar. And this is a cervical cancer epithelial cells with 80 nanometer gold particles. And so this is what you typically see under the microscope. And this is at 40x. Um, the cell is here. And this is a, a video that sections back and forth um, up and down from the top to bottom of the cell. And, and we see the different different focal planes. Here it is at 100x. We see the nucleus here in the center of the cell, the membrane, and then these particles, some of which you can actually see moving around uh, either 
somewhere inside maybe a vacuole or somewhere trapped between the membrane and the nucleus. And so this is a, I'm going to go back and just pause it for a second. Something that we get asked continually and we have since the beginning of the, the release of the technology is, I see and it's great, but what are these, like where are these particles? Um, I can section through and, and see here that, you know, these particles are obviously at different focal planes, but are they inside the cell? Are they on top of the cell? And if, if we go back and we look, we don't really know. We can sort of surmise that, that these are within the cell. Uh, certainly these ones that are kind of moving around, kind of trapped, we can sort of, you know, guess that they are inside the cell, but we're not really sure. So we took upon ourselves to sort of see if we could answer this, this question. And so from an image like this that you would see under the microscope, what we've done is, is we've taken some hardware and developed some software to be able to sort of try to deconstruct this, this 3D um, dimensionality, you know, this, this Z dimensionality of this image and, and visualize it. So what I have here is I actually have a sample and we'll go over this more later in more detail, but basically this is a, this is a 3D reconstruction I have here of a cell's nucleus that has been uh, stained with DAPI, so we know it's the nucleus, and nanoparticles surrounding it. And this is basically the result of what our software can do. Um, this is just two, two components of this particular image, uh, which is the DAPI stained nucleus and the particles. Um, you can have as, as, as many aspects and um, components of your sample as you want visualized. Uh, you can add different fluorescent tags, maybe a membrane or mitochondrial stain or something like that. You can image these individually and then reconstruct these into a, into a 3D image. And, and here we see these red spheres. These red spheres indicate a single nanoparticle or at least a, an aggregation of particles that are seen as one object. Um, and this is proprietary software that um, this program has that, that we've come up with that identify the center of where the scattered light is coming from for these particles. And so we're able to actually put this into some kind of 3D rendering and, and we see that these particles are sort of surrounding the nucleus. And then later I'll show you that there's actually some, some particles that, that are maybe possibly inside this nucleus. Um, and we'll go over that later, but I just wanted to show you guys this because this is sort of the end result of what we sort of saw in that video. It's not the same sample, but it's the same idea. You know, we have a cell with a nucleus and some particles, and we want to know, are these particles inside the cell? Are they inside the nucleus? In this case is what this particular researcher wants to find out. So now I'm going to go back to the presentation. And I want to go over a couple of applications. So the research applications that this technology can apply to, um, so far what we found is nanotoxicology, cancer research, nanoparticle characterization, and drug delivery. Uh, nanotoxicology, we have an application uh, with the system in South Africa where they're looking at carbon uh, nanotubes and silica uh, particles in lung tissue. Uh, this would be a um, an application where they want to know, are they inside the cells? Are they inside the tissue? And this technology can, can help answer those questions. Uh, cancer research, that's actually the sample that we just looked at that we'll go back to. This was a application in particular uh, that I'll, I'll explain here from a paper uh, where the researcher wanted to find out if these particles that had these certain conjugates on them, were the particles getting inside the cell and more importantly, were they getting inside the nucleus? And so this was a, a really helpful technology for this research group to find some answers to those questions. For nanoparticle characterization, um, a lot of times people are just wanting to know what the structures of their nanoparticles are. They're doing some kind of um, research where they want to know if the particles are aggregating and where they're aggregating on maybe some kind of surface or some kind of gel. Uh, we've looked at that. Um, there's an application that I'll show you here from a paper where they're looking at particles on a, uh, a bone matrix. Uh, drug delivery, 
obviously you can conjugate drugs to particles and they can penetrate tissue and cells and they want to see where those particles go and this can be can be helpful in that area of research uh, here are a couple of, of of images one is very similar to the one you just saw where we have a daffy stained nucleus and then it's surrounded by these red spheres that are showing where the location of the particles are in the 3d space and on the right we have multi-wall carbon nanotubes and lung tissue um, i believe this image came from some work we did with NIO, the national institute of health here in the united states they look at multi-wall carbon nanotube uptake in lung tissue and they'd like to know where these nanotubes tend to aggregate and are they actually piercing any of the tissue or are they just in these spaces and these alveolar spaces uh, so here in this image we see this gray is the tissue and the red is indication of the multi-wall carbon nanotube multi-wall carbon nanotubes scatter light very efficiently they're quite bright they kind of look like these spaghetti noodles and so this is what the um, carbon nanotube is represented as and here we kind of see it is kind of embedded in this tissue um, just wanted to also mention here that you know, this, this technique has, has steps um, in terms of the acquisition, which I'll, I'll talk about, but um, a lot of these samples that I'm showing today have fluorescent aspects to them. And that is important when it comes to deconvolution and point spread function, as I'll explain. And if you're familiar with this at all, you know that deconvolution um, has to have a point spread function feature to deconvolve certain wavelengths of light and certain recording conditions. Um, but it's not necessarily 100% that your sample has to be fluorescent for it to be able to be deconvolved. Obviously, these nanoparticles are not fluorescent. These gold particles on the left and this carbon nanotube on the right, they were not stained at all. And that's that's an important thing to remember. It's, it's great that these researchers do not have to put any kind of fluorescent stain on these particles. Uh, that can cause toxicity issues and it can it can be a problem so the great thing about using our dark field with this is that these particles scatter so much light that they're that they're usually the brightest object in the sample and that makes it easier to locate the center of these nanoparticles which i'll show you but the tissue and the cell structure even though researchers like to stain parts of the cells so they definitely know yes that's the membrane yes that's the nucleus um or other components of the cells, they don't necessarily have to be stained. Um, the software can do sort of what I call a, a poor man's deconvolution on the unstained tissue. And it will give you a, a pretty good idea of the boundaries of this, of the non-stained area. Um, it won't give you, you know, a super precise crisp image like a fluorescently stained section would, but it will definitely give you a general bound general boundaries and i want to show you guys another video i have here of a example of that which is a cell and this is a this is a a cell that has a stained nucleus and these red spheres represent um gold nanoparticles but the gray in this case, the, the gray area of the cell is just cellular, um, non-stained cellular membrane and cytoplasm. And so this was three different stacks collected. There was a stack collected just for the nanoparticles, a stack that was collected for the cytoplasm and the membrane, and then a separate stack, a third stack collected of just the nucleus. So when you combine all these together, you see a non-stained feature with uh, within the sample and a stained feature, and then obviously the the uh, nanoparticles. Um, and then what you'll see here later in this video, it's going to zoom in. You're going to see I'm going to strip away parts of. Um, you can isolate each layer and strip it away with either by adjusting the, the threshold or the transparency is what it's called in the software of it. And so these these particles you see, there's some of them that are outside the cell. And then as we start to strip away um, the, the membrane and the cytoplasm aspect of it, uh, you'll see, you'll sort of reveal where the other nanoparticles are. Sort of fast forward here. Yeah, so I've, here we've selected just the, the cytoplasm and the membrane and, and we're taking it away and we're putting it back. 
And this can all be done in the in the 3D viewer part of the software. So this is an example, yeah, here in the image, I'm adjusting the transparency of this layer and, and you can see that. So this is an example of, of um, a time where you could actually, you know, see part of a, of a non-fluorescent aspect. And then I took away the nucleus here and we see there's this, this, this hole left. So I just wanted to show this as an example to, to also mention that, you know, not everything has to be fluorescent. Okay, so going back to the presentation here, this was a um, a paper, one of the papers that came out of this, and um, we see this was a paper that that I helped co-author uh, with a with a group at Ryerson University uh, in Canada, and this was the sample uh, that I showed earlier of the gold nanoparticles uh, surrounding the the nucleus, but in this case, she took it a step further. And what she wanted to do was um, she conjugated these gold nanoparticles with this DNA break um, and wanted to find out if the DNA breaks separate from the gold nanoparticles and go into the nucleus or not. And so this was the um, this was the paper that came out of that that work that we did together. And this uh, graphic here represents what are the result? Uh, these are still images, but there were videos that were similar to the one I just showed you that we that we made. Um, and so on the left, we see just the, the DAPI stain nucleus. And then in the middle, we see these green particles. This is what is represented as the uh, DNA breaks uh, for cell treatment. So the idea is that these particles penetrate the cell, uh, these DNA breaks break off, and they go to hopefully the nucleus and do their job. Um, and so here on the right, we have the merged data, which is the nucleus plus the DNA break plus the red, which are represented as the gold particles. So this was a great technology for her because this was a, another technique. She used other techniques to, um, to, to visualize this, but this was a great technique for her because with the dark field and the 3D system that she had, she was able to visualize what the nucleus was, of course, and then more importantly, where were the particles in relation to the nucleus and were these DNA breaks leaving these particles going where they were supposed to go? And so here she was able to visualize all three of those. Um, another paper that's come out of this is from Romania and uh, they were using these um, 3D uh, super paramagnetic particles on a uh, simulated scaffold for bone. And so here what they were doing was uh, they made this, this bone out of this uh, photo, uh, photosynthetic ormacore composite. And it was stained with a, a fluorescein stain, a green fluorescent stain. And then they were putting different concentrations of these uh, super paramagnetic particles uh, on the scaffold, see um, how they were reacting with the scaffold. And so here is the the images that came out of that, this, this sort of U-shaped scaffolding here, um, they have TEM and SEM images of it in the paper, but you see it's these, it's these series of U's, U-shapes uh, from, um, from this material. And then they put different concentrations of these uh, nanoparticles on there. And we see on the left is the concentration where there's zero milligrams per milliliter, and in the middle they add more, two milligrams per milliliter, and then to the right, four milligrams per milliliter. And so here they're able to visualize the, the concentration and the distribution of these particles in the 3D space of this, of this bone scaffold. So I'm going to go over a little bit about the patented dark field optics that, that make this possible for this 3D system. And a lot of you are familiar with it because you might already have it, but this is a really nice graphic that we've had made to indicate how this is how this is special. And so the dark field illumination uses scatter from the sample to improve the detection. So what's great about this is we're putting so much light on the sample that we're able to detect things below the below the resolution limit. Um, depending on what the particles are made from, uh, they have different detection limits, and I'll talk about that. But this is a great graphic because it talks about how we are coupling the illumination directly to the condenser, and then we're providing perfect color illumination and then we're maximizing, by doing those, we're maximizing the photo photons on the sample and it's minimizing light loss. So we usually see in what we've tested ourselves and what others have, 
have tested about a 10x increase in signal to noise ratio. And if we watch this slide, we see that the light comes out of the source through the light guide with no light loss. And then it goes into a series of, a series of columnating lenses inside our condenser. Passes through some columnating lenses and then onto a mirror that's mounted inside the, the housing here. And the light travels up through the dark field annulus and then gets focused onto the, the sample. So this distance between where the, the, the mirror and the annulus is, is, is the color illumination, and this is fixed. This makes this extremely easy to align and use, but then it also maximizes the amount of photons on it uh, by having this fixed color illumination and also having the light managed in this, in this way that was just uh, illustrated here. And then the light passes up to the sample into the objective and depending on the numerical aperture of your objective, the light is either collected or you do not see the light because the numerical aperture is um, lower than the numerical aperture of the condenser. So how is that different from traditional dark field? I'm just going to go through this slide really quick. In standard dark field, we see uh, the light is attached to the scope. It comes through a series of plastic diffusing lenses down here at the bottom and some air off a mirror through more air, seven to nine centimeters of air and then it's focused onto the sample and the user has to adjust for color illumination themselves. So with our system, like I said, we usually see a 10X improvement from standard dark field. And this was actually proven. Um, one study that was done a while ago by Dow Chemical, which they looked at 240 nanometer polystyrene beads. Um, they took a image on the left with standard dark field, image on the right with our dark field, and you see how much brighter our, our system is on the right. Uh, there was a paper that came out of uh, the Korean Chemical Society here. They actually did some precise measurements using standard dark field, conventional dark field as they call it on top, see the A and the B, and they have a signal to noise ratio number that they've calculated for each of those samples A and B. And then with the side of EVA enhanced dark field, D and E, we see these signal to noise number increase. And so this is about, about 10 times more powerful. And this was actually um, measured by them in their lab. So this is just an, another example of, of how that was improved. So in terms of what this means from a practical standpoint, if you're looking at noble metals and metal oxide nanoparticles, you can detect the scatter of light off particles down to about 10 to 15 nanometers. Polymeric part particles, it goes down to between 40 and 60 nanometers. And for what we call soft particles, like liposomes, et cetera, lipid particles, down to about 50 to 75 nanometers. So what are these 3D components? Um, so we have a camera, and it is a Q-imaging 825 monochrome camera. We use a monochrome camera because uh, the deconvolution seems to work better on uh, monochrome images than color. And so here are the specs on the camera. Uh, we use a, a nano stage. Uh, this nano stage is made by Mad City Labs and has a 200 micron travel range. And this stage is pretty much just sets into the microscope stage that you already have on your microscope, if you're a current side of EVA user, this would just fit right into the prior stage that's that's on your scope. Um, and this has a very good repeatability of 0.4 nanometers. So this stage sits uh, inside the other stage and holds your sample. And then the, the, the brain here, the nano drive, controls the, the step size and the voltage to the stage. And then there's another aspect, uh, which is a product of ours that is a optical product called the dual mode fluorescence module. So part of this technology is fluorescent and the dual mode fluorescent module provides the excitation and emission for the fluorescence for the fluorescent aspect of your sample. Um, and so what this does is this will couple between uh, a fluorescent light source and the actual condenser. So in that earlier graphic, you saw the light, the light source going directly into the condenser you would have a fluorescent lamp and this would go in between uh, that lamp and the condenser. And inside this box are uh, up to four different excitation filters. And then there's gonna be an emission filter either in the analyzer slot or turret of the microscope 
And this is able to provide uh, excitation fluorescence for your sample. But what's different about this from standard fluorescence is in standard epifluorescence, you will only see what's fluorescent. Uh, with our dual mode fluorescent module, you're actually able to modulate between full fluorescence and no fluorescence. And we see that in these three images at the bottom. On the, on the bottom right here, this is what a full fluorescent image would be of, of some dappy stain nucleus that are sort of in a bundle of cells here. Then on the far left is the just dark field image with no fluorescence at all. So this is what you would see with, with no fluorescent excitation or emission whatsoever. And then in the middle, this is what's called the dual mode fluorescent image. And this is made by modulating this, this uh, wheel here between full, a fully excited path with a filter in place to sort of eclipsing past the light path and introducing what we call full spectrum light from the lamp. And we're able to get this combined image. So this is nice because you're able to see in relationship um, the, the the ratio between what's fluorescent and what's not fluorescent in one image rather than having to take several images and combine them. But uh, this is another part of the of the 3D system that you'll need for uh, fluorescent excitation. Okay, so I'm just going to talk about deconvolution and point spread function real quick. Um, if you're not familiar with um, 3D imaging um, at all, uh, to deconvolve an image means to clean up the image from an optical distortion standpoint. Meaning when you take a picture and you have several different planes in that one picture, you have a background that might be out of focus and a person that's in focus in the foreground. And then you take a picture of the background, but the person in the foreground is out of focus. So if you take several pictures like that at different focal depths, you're going to have parts of uh, your image that are in focus and parts of your image that are out of focus. Deconvolution, and this is the term here, the technical definition for it, um, basically reversing the optical distortion. So you're taking away the out of focus light from the image. And to do that, you have to have something called a point spread function. And the point spread function describes the response of an imaging system to a point source or point object. Basically, these are the numbers that you need to deconvolve the image or to clean up the image specifically for the recording conditions of that image. So to deconvolve something that has a DAPI stain, a blue fluorescent stain, um, the point spread function for that is going to be different from if it has a FITSI stain, a green fluorescent stain, because of the wavelength, of uh, the peak wavelength. So to know how to deconvolve something, you need to have a point spread function for it. And this is usually in the form of a file. In this case, it's going to be a file that the deconvolution algorithm, which is what it is, uh, needs to know for it to do its job best. And to sort of visualize that here, uh, deconvolution, this is unprocessed on the left, processed on the right. Obviously, this looks a lot more cleaned up. So in this instance, this was probably, uh, uh, you know, this was just something I got off the Internet. This is a, a fluorescently stained cell here uh, with several components. And so each one of these components probably had to be deconvolved, the red and the blue and, and the gray here, I'm assuming is some other kind of fluorescent stain. Um, and these were deconvolved and put back together. And they were deconvolved by a special point spread function. And someone explained point spread function to me one time that was pretty great, which is see these ripple patterns here. Well, it's kind of like throwing a stone or an object into a water source, uh, you know, a puddle or a lake, and seeing these ripples. Well, the ripples create patterns, and depending on the size and maybe even shape of the object that you throw into the water, these ripple patterns are going to be different. Uh, so think of your image as the object you're throwing in the water and the ripple pattern being what you need to make the image look better. Um, you have to have a specific set of ripple patterns to deconvolve each image. And so that's kind of what a point spread function is, is, is you tell it the wavelength, the numerical aperture of the objective, the numerical aperture, a refractive index of the media that it's in, your pixel spacing, all of these um, sort of parameters need to be inputted to make this point spread function to best clean up your image. And that's, that's sort of the analogy I like to use. So the acquisition software is pretty basic. Um, it's basically the stage and camera that I showed you early working in synchrony. And so here we have a, um, a graphic that shows the 3D, the side of view of 3D acquisition window on the left and then a live preview on the right. Um, 
So what this uh, 3D acquisition GUI uh, user interface is asking for is basic things like exposure time, um, how bright, you know, um, how, much, how much exposure you need to get uh, proper signal to noise, and then your delta Z, which is your Z resolution. How many nanometers or microns are you going to have between the stacks? So this is your Z resolution. And then here we have a couple of features that allow you to focus to the very top and the very bottom of your image. So in other words, you're going to set the microscope to focus somewhat in the center of the sample. And then you use these Z top and bottom buttons to navigate to the top and the bottom. And then based off your uh, Z resolution here, it's going to tell you, okay, you're going to have 50 slices or 25 slices, depending on your, on your top and bottom set and the uh, Z, Z depth. And then we save the image and acquire the image. Um, it does output some metadata that is basically just a, a meta file that tells you all the parameters that were used for each stack. Um, you can control the slice spacing and, of course, set your exposure time. And then once these have been acquired, um, these stacks, you can use our 3D enhanced dark field imaging analysis software. Um, this is a patented software. Um, the particular part of the patent here is based off the three-dimensional image processing that we use to locate these uh, nanoparticles in the 3D space. And I'm going to go ahead and show you that here in a minute. Uh, the 3D analysis software has uh, basically three main functions. It has a deconvolution routine, it has an interpolation routine, and then has the nanoparticle locator. So basically, this is the main part of the 3D analysis feature that will deconvolve the image, interpolate it, and then if you have a stack that you want to just locate nanoparticles in, it will do that. So you kind of use these in steps in synchrony to create this 3D image. Um, like I mentioned before, for each component of your sample, you do a separate stack. Uh, you don't change anything about the acquisition parameters, you just would change your light source. So for example, on this image here on the left, which are the gold nanoparticles in relation to the nucleus, you're going to do a stack with just fluorescent excitation emission for DAPI, and then you're going to put full spectrum light and take a stack of the sample again with the same parameters from top to bottom. Maybe change your exposure time, obviously, um, but you're not going to move the stage at all. And then it's going to do a stack, and you're basically going to be left with a stack that's just of uh, showing the brightest particles in the image, the nanoparticles, and then you're going to recombine these. Uh, there's a point spread function generation part of the software. As I mentioned, to do deconvolution, you have to generate a point spread function. And so this just shows all of the conditions you need to be aware of to input into the uh, point spread function generator. So you need to know the numerical aperture of your objective, the refractive index of your media, the refractive index of the objective you're using, if it's water or oil, the wavelength, the peak wavelength, and then how big the um, the pixel sizes are. So all of this go into generating a, what's called a point spread function file. We also have a numerical aperture generation software. And so this will find the numerical aperture of your system. So on some of these objectives, if you've worked with oil immersion objectives, especially there's, a, there's an iris, a collar on the objective, and it will change the numerical aperture from something low to something high. Um, and there's really no indication numbers on the objective to tell you exactly where you are. And since that's, that's an important part of generating a point spread function, this allows you to be able to set the collar of an oil objective somewhere between the lowest and highest setting. And you can take a certain point of your image and draw a box around it, and it will tell you the point spread function based off the scatter of the object. So now I want to go through the sample a little bit more and sort of tell you a little bit about the sample and sort of go over how this would work. So we saw on the microscope earlier um, this, this video that I showed that shows this sort of stack particles in and around this nucleus. So this is kind of what you would see on the microscope at this point you're getting ready to do this. So the way I would do tackle this is I would take a stack first of the fluorescently stained portion of the cell, which is this. This is the nucleus. 
So this represents the nucleus of a cell, and in this case, they want to find where these particles, which is the stack here on the left, are in relation to this nucleus. So here on the right is the end result of the deconvolution of the of the nucleus, and I'm going to talk about that in a second. But this is basically the undeconvolved raw stack of the nucleus, and we start at the top and we slice through it and go through some focal planes, and you'll see here. These little dark shadows, these are actually the nanoparticles blocking the light during this, which is which is very interesting. Um, so you run the deconvolution routine on this nucleus and you get this. And this is the cleaned up, deconvolved, dappy stained nucleus. And if we want to just compare how these look in the 3D viewer, I will look at just the nucleus undeconvolved and it's just kind of this blob you don't get any even boundary information it's just sort of the edges of the, of the whole image here so not much to see there because it is undeconvolved but then if i go to the deconvolved slice and we look at it ah uh, now we're starting to see some some, some more structure uh, a lot more definition and so this is the difference between the undeconvolved and the deconvolved so now that we've deconvolved this, we want to put this the slice, uh, the slices of the nanoparticles in with this. So here we see that this is just a, a stack, and this was just with broad spectrum light. Uh, the particles are the brightest thing in the image, so it's very easy to get an image here, a stack, I should say, that that's that pretty much just shows the particles because the signal to noise ratio of the condenser is so great. Um, it's really really good for this because the nanoparticles in these situations tend to be the brightest objects and so we're only seeing them which is great so then we use our locate uh nanoparticle routine so here are the 3d plugins here and if you'll notice this is all in image j um, we put our uh 3d analysis features and the numerical aperture generator and the point spread function generator we put all of these in image j because um image j is a really great program it's a it's the image analysis program that's made by NIH, and you can download it. And of course, if you've used it, you know you can add plugins to it. So these are plugins you would just add to ImageJ. And um, it's really nice because obviously ImageJ does other things like you can process it by sharpening the image, and you can um, change the brightness and contrast of the image, and you can you know falsely color these images. So once these stacks are in ImageJ and you run these you know uh, deconvolution routines and clean it up uh, you can even you know take it further if you want by sharpening them and false coloring them so we put all this in image j so i just wanted to mention that i know it seems obvious but uh so in the plugins menu we, we see our plugins and if we go to the 3d analysis uh part we have a just locate nanoparticle section and so what this is going to do is you tell how big each pixels are and your 3d spacing and you set a nano threshold, so you have to tell the software, hey, for it to be countered as a nanoparticle, it has to be over a certain intensity. Um, and so the way that this is done is pretty much you just kind of, you know, you can go through the stack and, and find particles that are, you know, maybe not as bright as other ones like this one, and you can kind of go over it and see that, you know, they have um, an intensity value of, of something, you know, of X, whatever it winds up being, this one's 7,000, 5,000. So you sort of just set a threshold for um, for how bright the object has to be for it to be counted as a nanoparticle. And so you run the locate nanoparticle routine. I've already kind of entered in the, the parameters here for this one. It was a 300 nanometer or 0.3 micron spacing on these. Those are the acquisition parameters. And it's going to run and it's going to look through L100 slices. And it's going to spit out this table here. And you see here, uh, the log tells you found 49 nanoparticles, okay? And it gives you some detail about the brightness of each one, which plane it was on, its X and Y coordinate, the original slice that it was on, along with the interpolated slice. Now, I mentioned interpolation earlier, and this is a good time to talk about it. These pixels have a certain X, Y dimension. In other words, this was taken with a 100X objective, which means each pixel in this image is about 64 and a half nanometers uh in the x and y so it's 64 and a half nanometers by 64 and a half nanometers but the distance between each pixel in the z we set to be 300 nanometers 0.3 microns so 
if you look at this as not a pixel, but what we call a voxel, which is a three-dimensional pixel, a volume pixel is where the term voxel came <laughs> comes from, which is cool. Um, it is a not a cube. It's actually a a rectangular cube. It's the rectangle, um, and so we have a pixel that's 300 nanometers by 64 nanometers by 64 nanometers. So we're sort of looking at a at a rectangle and not a cube. Um, so the interpolation, what it does is it actually creates more slices by slicing up these uh, rectangles into cubes. So the original slice might be 28, but the interpolated slice is number 128. And so that's how this works. Basically, anytime deconvolution is done, it interpolates it to make a stack that has more stacks than the original. So we see here in the original DAPI stack, it is a hundred slices, those how many slices were in the original, but the interpolated slice could be more than that. So this is 279. So when we get done with this, basically, you can say those measurements, by the way, we have a, a, a stack that's represented of just the nanoparticles as these red uh, orbs, these red balls here. And so what we want to do now that we have the nucleus uh, deconvolved and we have the nanoparticles located, is we want to combine these into one uh, viewing area. So we can either do that in a 2D way where we add this image to this image and, and we see it go you know, back and forth this way, but the best way to visualize it, I find, is by making, making them combined in this 3D viewer. So I'm going to make this deconvolved nucleus be blue. I'm going to saturate it, make it a little brighter. And then from this 3D viewer, before I, I, I start looking at it, I'm going to add content from open image and I'm going to add the, these nanoparticles here. So now that I have both of these loaded into the viewer, we can actually see where these particles are in relationship to the nucleus. And so this is, this is the really powerful part where you're able to visualize, you know, are these particles where I think they are or, or I don't think they are. And so in here, uh, a nice part of this is we can select just one aspect of the uh, 3D viewer. So I'm going to select just the nucleus. And then I can adjust the transparency or the threshold. And then as I do this, I'm sort of taking away part of it to sort of visualize to see if there's anything inside here. So like I, like I mentioned, I, I, I think that there's a couple of these particles that are actually, yeah, so these two particles right here in, in, the, in the sort of bottom right center here, uh, if I adjust the transparency, I can see that these are actually, actually inside the nucleus. Or just inside the barrier right here, just inside. So this is a powerful tool. Um, to visualize this information. And you can do things like you can make movies from this and still shots from this, um, and you're able to see, you know, where these particles are in, in relation to um, the rest of the cell. And this can be saved as a movie, can be saved as a TIFF. So at this point, I want to sort of invite people to, uh, to ask me some some questions. Um, if you have any questions, please type them in this box. I'm going to go back here and I will answer them. Also, in terms of uh, samples, um, you know, in, in terms of what kind of samples that can be visualized with this, when you're using our dark field, it's what we call transmitted dark field. Um, obviously, cell layers are, are, are very easy to visualize, as you can see. Uh, but when it comes to tissue, uh, tissue samples, usually we tell people that, you know, anything over 20, 30 microns is, is probably going to be a little too thick for, um, for tissue sections in terms of penetrating light really efficiently enough to, to see all the components that we need to see. But it's also noted, we should also say that this technique, this 3D technique is not limited to just 
are transmitted dark field, if you have some kind of uh, opaque surface that you think has um, some kind of maybe some some 3D aspect to it and you want to see if this might work, uh, we can look at, we can use this technique with um, reflected optics, meaning you can use reflected dark field or just, uh, you know, straight transmitted or straight reflected dark field, straight reflected microscopy. Um, so we've we've done some testing and we've done some samples for people in reflected mode as well. So it's not just restricted to our dark field. Um, the deconvolution software uh, works just as well on the reflected data as it does on the transmitted data. So it's not just um, restricted to that. And then I also wanted to mention here on the, on the slide, on the last slide here, we have uh, the website, um, our website address for the 3D imaging page here. And then also if you have any questions about the technology or any, any questions about your samples and if this would be applicable, you can email us at applications at cytoviva.com, and that's right here. And also, a copy of this webinar will be uh, available soon to, uh, to, to download and to also watch online. And then also a copy of this presentation will also be available if you if you'd like a copy of it. So just any, any questions you have, uh, you can contact me at applications at cytoviva. Okay. Ah, here we go. All right, we got some questions. Uh, one question here is, uh, thank you to the webinar. I would like to ask if you consider organizing some workshop lab meeting for people. For people who do not have access to it yet somewhere in Europe, when will the situation will be more normal? Yeah, so I, I guess I should have opened up my whole, whole webinar here with, uh, I hope everybody is safe. Um, and yeah, this is a crazy situation we're all in. We're all staying at home. I'm actually doing this at home. Um, and that's actually one thing I, I, I did forget to mention in the webinar that I think is important is that I'm running this software on just my, my laptop. Um, normally this 3D system, uh, one of the components I forgot to mention actually is we do provide a very robust computer. We actually build our own computers here um, for this and they have a lot of RAM and they have a lot of processors because the deconvolution is pretty, um, uh, it's pretty intense in terms of a processing uh, on the computer. So I did not demonstrate the deconvolution live because it is pretty taxing and my little laptop with only eight gigs of RAM wasn't gonna cut it. Um, so these computers that we have are, are a little bit more robust, but, but yeah, so sorry to get sidetracked, but. Yes, so in terms of coming to Europe, um, we do have a distributor there, and uh, we will, if you want to send us an email uh, to the applications at cytoviva.com or info at cytoviva.com, um, we can talk to you in more detail about, about maybe when we'll be in Europe and, and, and when we could organize some kind of demonstration for this. Um, can you use it to look at cellulose fibers? If yes, what is the size limit of those particles? Uh, thank you, Adriana. Um, yeah, so I actually have looked at cellulose fibers uh, with our dark field before. I haven't done any 3D imaging with them yet, um, but I have looked at cellulose fibers and they are very possible to visualize them. In terms of a limit of detection, um, I'm assuming you're asking about the, the lower limit, how small can these fibers be? And based off of cellulose fibers that I've looked at before, the ones that I've looked at were around 150 to 200 nanometers in diameter, and they were several microns long. Um, so if you have any more information on those, you can, you can email us and um, we can uh, definitely uh, talk about uh, your particular samples. But um, but I, I, I have looked at cellulose fibers, not with a 3D system. I think it would be very interesting, and I also think it'd be very possible. Um, what does the special sample support do to create a 3D image? What does the special sample support? So if you're wondering what kind of samples we're able to visualize, I guess that's what this question is. Um, we, you know, anything that, as 3D structure and light can transmit through. 
um, cells, tissue, um, particles in certain layers. Um, someone just asked about, you know, cellulose fibers, things like that that light can transmit through. Uh, that's for our transmitted dark field. Um, I mentioned before this software can be used to deconvolve and look at images that are, you know, or samples that are opaque. It depends on what they are and what they're made of, what their topography is. If it has a lot of topography, something like uh, reflected dark field would probably work pretty well. And so I'm guessing uh, that is the question that you're asking. Uh, if you want to email us and for, you know, maybe we can have an offline conversation more about if I answered that correctly. <laughs> uh, maybe you already mentioned it, but is it possible to detect nanoplastics? Ah, great question. So we have done a lot of hyperspectral work with nanoplastics. Um, this is probably also another good time to mention that this is an optical technique. Um, I know that we sell a hyperspectral microscope, and that's that's you know what what our main business is. And the three D is more of an add on to the hyperspectral or optical system, but it's an optical system only. So I just wanted to mention that that these three D images have nothing to do with our hyperspectral system. This is just um, a purely optical. Uh, system to deconvolve and look at uh, objects and samples in the in the 3D realm. That being said, nanoplastics we've done a lot of work with um, on the hyperspectral part, but I haven't done any samples with 3D, but it's totally possible. Nanoplastics, uh, we can see them very well with our dark field system, so there's no reason why I don't think it would not be a great tool for detecting nanoplastics in uh, different matrices. Um, and so like like I'm telling everybody else, you want to email us and we can talk more about this in detail. But yes, I, I think that would be very possible. Uh, we have a question here about hyaluronic acid and chitosan nanoparticles in confocal microscopy. They are polymeric particles between 135 and 150 nanometers. So they could be detected by this technology. Um, absolutely. Polymeric particles, um, I mentioned we, we estimate the detection limit all the way down to, you know, 40, 60 nanometers, somewhere in there. So anything over 100 nanometers is going to be very easy for us to see these. Um, so yes, I, I think this is a, definitely a, a case where polymeric particles would be a great, um, great application for this technology. Is it possible to image DNA origami fibers ah, or filaments? Um, I do not know. I have not looked at those before. Um, the only DNA that I've looked at with the system is those double-stranded DNA breaks that I did with that paper with uh, the research group in Montreal, and I don't know exactly how large those DNA breaks were. They were also fluorescently labeled, so they were a bit easier to see. Um, if you know the size of these filaments, I could probably tell you better, but since, uh, you know, these fibers are probably don't have any kind of, you know, obviously don't have any kind of plasmonic prep properties from noble metals or anything like that, it wouldn't be a detection limit that would be down, you know, on those limits of, you know, 10, 20, 30 nanometers. I think this would sort of classify in the soft nanoparticle category for us, which would be maybe 75 nanometers or so. Um, but again, you can, uh, uh, if you want to email me and, and we can talk more about this uh, offline and and uh, if you can give me some information about the size of these DNA uh, fibers, um, I can let you know how possible it is. So I hope I answered everybody's questions and um, it was great talking to you guys today and letting you guys know about the technology. So just email us and let us know your thoughts, uh, your questions. Uh, we'd love to help you guys out and hope everyone stays safe out there. And just remember that this webinar will be up, uh, the recorded version will be up again. Oh, we have a question here. You mentioned. Uh, we can look at multi-wall carbon nanotubes and tissues. Is it possible to look in other tissues and quantify? Yes, uh, I'm sure. Um, we've looked at multi-wall carbon nanotubes in lung tissue. Obviously, there was a, you know, a lot of concern about the inhalation of, of carbon nanotubes for a while. A lot of people did studies with mice. Uh, but, and, and, but in other tissues, yes. So to visualize particles in tissue, um, we typically say that with our transmitted dark field system, any tissues need to be less than 20, 30 microns. Anything over 20, 30 microns thick, a little bit difficult to transmit light through them efficiently enough to, to see the scatter of everything you want to see. 
but yes, I, I think if you um, provide us with tissue that's beneath that, we could definitely see it. So I'll just stay on the line here for another minute or two in case anyone has any follow-up questions. I'm just gonna go back through here and make sure I didn't miss it. Okay. Is it possible to quantify without labeling? Uh, yes. If um, if you're talking about labeling the particles, um, yeah. So what I was uh, what I said at the beginning of the of the webinar. I hope I made that clear. Um, one of the advantages to this technique is you don't have to fluorescently label the nanoparticles. So things like gold, carbon nanotubes. We looked at titanium dioxide. We looked at silica particles. Um, those particles are very bright and dark field. They scatter light really well, so really efficiently. So as long as your particles are the brightest object in the sample, this technique will will work great. Um, if it's a if it's a situation where the nanoparticles do not scatter light as uh, more than the surrounding area, like for example, maybe with liposomes that aren't labeled. Uh, liposomes are these little fat particles, and, and they tend to sort of get lost in the uh, in the sample. Not saying we can't see them or visualize them, but they're not significantly brighter than the background. Um, and in terms of labeling the tissue, um, yes, it is possible to um, get some basic uh, fundamental um, information about location of these particles against unstained tissue and unstained matrices. But ideally, you want to stain the tissue because, or stain the areas because then you have a, um, a much more, um, you know, deconvolved, sharper image to visualize against. Okay, well, I guess I'm going to adjourn for now. Uh, but like I mentioned, please send us an email at applications at cytoviva.com and we will uh, continue this conversation offline. Okay, oh, here's another one. Is there any special requirements for sample preparation? Um, so if you're referring to samples like we looked at today, cells and tissue, no, not really. Um, in fact, I should also mention that I've looked at cells live on the microscope with this technique. Um, it's a little tough sometimes if things are moving around. The, the video that I showed where the particles are kind of bouncing around, obviously it's a little difficult to get uh, location information of particles that are moving around a lot. But um, I have looked at some live samples of cells with particles in the microscope where the particles were, were, were stuck or static and we were able to look at those. But um, in terms of cells and tissue, it's just your, your normal sample tissue prep. Like I said, as long as tissue samples are under 20 or 30 microns or so, um, we should be good. Now for non-biologicals, um, you know, things like maybe gels or, you know, maybe you've got some kind of uh, biofilm or something like that. Um, as long as um, it's not thicker than 20 or 30 microns, our transmitted dark field, you know, our enhanced dark field will work. And if it's um, any thicker than that and it's more opaque, uh, we can definitely try to visualize it with reflected dark field or, or just straight reflected optics. Uh, we have a question here. Would it be possible to visualize mineralized tissue like bone tissue, assuming slices are thinner than 20 microns, of course? Yes. I have looked at bone tissue slices, um, 5 to 10 microns, and was able to uh, visualize um, the tissue just fine. Um, I don't remember if I've ever looked at bone tissue that had particles in it or not, so that would be interesting. Um, but yes, mineralized bone tissue under 20 microns, pr preferably 5 to 10 microns for bone tissue because it is pretty dense. Um, I have looked at that before, yes. You're welcome. <laughs> okay, well, I'm going to wait another minute to see if there's any last hanging questions here. Um, but if not, um, hope you guys stay safe out there and uh, hope to see a lot of you in the future soon.
All right. Well, thank you guys. I'm getting some thank yous. And uh, so I'm assuming people are wrapping up. I see the guest list is uh, dropping a little bit. Uh, well, everybody stay safe and please email us your questions. Um, we're always expanding this technology and looking for new applications and 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 everything. Um, so please, we encourage you guys to, to, to come to us with questions and um, we'll talk about your samples and um, if it's applicable. But thank you, everybody, and have a great day. Bye-bye.